Welcome everybody, I'm Barn with UCAN, and we are thrilled to be here today for Fueling for Triathlon Success. We're gonna have a great conversation here over the next 45 minutes or so with our two very special guests. We've got two-time Olympic medalist, Katie Zafaris. Katie, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me, I'm excited to talk about it. Awesome, Katie's a professional triathlete, of course, as well. And we are also joined by sports dietitian, Dina Griffin. Dina, thank you so much for being part of this as well. Thank you. I'm always delighted to chat with you, Varun. And I to be it. with the amazing Katie is, is a special honor. <laughs> Excellent, absolutely. And, and I really like these sessions and, and the well-rounded um, perspective that both of you guys are gonna provide, um, you know, from the athlete perspective, um, from the dietitian perspective. And Dina, not to sell you short at all, you're, um, quite the athlete as well. You've done a lot of endurance events and triathlons, ultra runs. So, um, so, you know, you straddle the fence between athlete and dietitian, but yeah, really nice to have both of your perspectives on here today. Um, just in terms of an overview, what we're going to talk about today, um, the, the purpose of this discussion is to really provide a comprehensive look on how to optimize energy for triathlon training and racing. Um, we're going to focus a little bit on the science off the top and talk about the importance of blood sugar control, strategies on what to eat and drink before, during, and after workouts. We'll also really dive into Katie's um, nutrition journey over the course of her career, and she'll share kind of what's worked for her, how things have evolved. Uh, Katie's a, uh, I don't know how long you get to be called a new mom, Katie, but I keep, I still keep calling you a new mom because shoot, I, my son's four and I feel like a new dad. So you're definitely a new mom, but uh, he's not a year yet. So until oh, a year, at least hundred <laughs> percent new mom. So yeah, Katie's going to talk us through kind of that the evolution in her feeling, um, you know, through all phases of life. Um, so with that, um, let's get to know you guys a little bit, Katie, uh, starting with you, tell us a little bit about your journey in the sport of triathlon up to this point. How did you get started in try and what keeps you going in the sport today? Yeah, the first triathlon I ever did was uh, right after I graduated high school. It was with my dad. Um, he wanted to do a triathlon on Father's Day, and he, we, I'm one of three girls, and I was the chosen, the chosen daughter for for the race, I suppose. And um, I didn't realize it at the time, but I think he had a little insight in, in his mind that I might be good at triathlon. I, I grew up swimming, and then I had run, ran track in high school, so I think it was actually more for me. Uh, finding out later, but that was my first one, but I definitely didn't think I'd become a professional triathlete, an Olympian or a medalist <laughs> or world champion at that point. I just was doing it for something to do with my dad on Father's Day. So I really didn't get into triathlon until being collegiate, being recruited in the collegiate recruitment program. And that kind of has fun, fueled my whole journey. So now I've gone to two Olympics, been world champion in 2019. Um, I was medalist in Tokyo, uh, bronze in the individual race, silver in the mixed relay. And then um, I had my son Kimball last July and never thought I'd come back to triathlon, but here we are. I, I love the sport. I love my job. So we're, we're trying it. <laughs> and you shared some, um, you know, for people that follow you on social media, you shared some really um, powerful and kind of interesting perspective on just like your motivation, um, you know, since being a mom and like you just alluded to it, like not knowing if you'd be back at this point. Now you're, you're kind of fully back racing as you've been doing the last um, few months. So has motivation changed or just, just touch on that a little bit. Like what's, what's different as you've re-entered the sport after having your, uh, your son. I think the motivation is still the same in the sense I've always just wanted to see what I can do and what like the best version of myself as an athlete can be. And now it, the only difference is I'm trying to be the best version of myself as an athlete and the best version of myself as a mom. And I think those are challenging to balance, but really it just means for me just a bit less training hours than I'm used to um, when I was solo athlete and not a mom. And also just obviously like energy balancing is different, but that's, there's also, it's a lot more challenging logistically, but there's a lot that I like to think that just like remains the same. And that keeps me, um, from getting too overwhelmed, I think, in like my new, my new responsibilities. And I guess like from myself, I just, I wasn't done with triathlon. Like the only reason I was going to stop doing triathlon was because I wasn't sure that I'd be a good enough mom and also be a good enough elite athlete, but I'm taking it little by little and also giving myself permission to pivot if I ever need to, if I feel like the balance is thrown off in a way that I'm not happy with. But right now I've just been like so thankful that we've come back because 
just looking through it through like Kimball's experiences and the people he's gotten to meet and like be a part of this community that has meant so much to me at like my highest times in triathlon, but also my lowest times, like when my dad passed away right before the Olympics, like the triathlon community really made a huge impact on supporting me, helping me to come back and just really kind of realizing like how wonderful this this group of people is that surrounds me. So Kimball getting to meet all these friends and officials and sponsors and, you know, just this, this whole group of people that has really brought me up multiple times in my career. Like it's, and go to call, like experience the different cultures. I mean, everything, every part of it, I'm like, ah, I would have missed out on so much if we didn't try this. (laughs) It's such a, such a great perspective. And it's, yeah, you you articulate it um, so well too, in terms of the motivation and the differences. So thanks for sharing that, Katie. We'll hear plenty more from you. on all aspects as, as we hang out for the next um, several minutes here. Um, Dina, moving over to you, tell us a little bit about your background, both um, in the endurance sports, sports world as an athlete, as well as your journey um, as, a, as a dietitian and somebody who's you know schooling people on nutrition. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'll try to be brief. I'm more the adult onset kind of athlete. I was never an athlete growing up. And so um, when I moved to Colorado from the Midwest in my late twenties, discovered more of the outdoors and running for fitness and then got interested in marathons and, you know, dabbling with the nutrition in terms of um, like, how do you do this as a newer athlete, endurance athlete. At the time, I wasn't a dietitian. I worked in the software field. Um, And so I had a lot of struggles myself trying to figure out the fueling and like personalizing this with the information at the time, which was quite a while ago now. Um, And that actually was part of my reason to get into this field of nutrition and specifically sports nutrition just like trying to figure it out for myself. But then along the way, seeing that I wasn't alone in the confusion and just trying to figure out some of the issues that uh, were happening that weren't so favorable for health or performance. So yeah, that was a few decades ago now. And so here I am at this point, um, running a business here based out of Boulder. I have an awesome colleague as well, but it's the best of both worlds. I mean, I get to practice what I preach, but also experiment and then see what, what all is going on with the other endurance athletes that we work with on a consulting basis. So it's really cool to see the evolution of sports nutrition and all the cool things that people are trying to do uh, athletically or just even for fitness and then trying to fuel that uh, from a health and performance perspective. How much do you feel like you're the fact that, you know, you have experienced a lot of the challenges that folks that you work with are experiencing when it comes to fueling for endurance sports? Like how much do you feel like that helps you or gives you an understanding of the dilemma that adult, you know, age group athletes go through? Yeah, I mean, I think it is quite valuable. I mean, we're all aging, but, you know, there's there's something to be said for, for walking in the shoes or being in the shoes, metaphorically speaking, of the kinds of sport that we do as endurance athletes. And, and although I haven't done the, you know, 100 different sports, I've certainly tried to participate in a number of them. And I think it's cool. I mean, even as a female athlete, aging I mean, we can bring up the menopause phase of life, all this kind of stuff. I mean, this, it like resonates with so many different people. And I think it's also part of inspiring those, like it's not never too late, no matter our age, whatever our ability is. And then like, oh yeah, I've been there too. Um, Blending in the science, maybe a little personal, but also the observational work and and so that nice mix of everything from the science to the real life application and and the end of one for all of us that's so true right it's um I think the biggest thing that you know as we've spent time over the years together is really understanding that there is no one size fits all approach and there's nothing and you know, I know in a lot of these sessions, it's tempting to kind of prevent, provide people with sweeping conclusions and this is going to work for everybody. And I, I wish we could do that. We're, we're not necessarily going to do that today, but hopefully we can give you enough kind of 
um, you know, feedback and, and different things that both Katie and Dina have seen and tried in, in their experience that'll give you at least some ideas on if I'm having some of these specific problems, what might be some strategies I can utilize to fix them. But yeah, Dina, that's a, that's a great point where it, it really is an N equals one in the personalization when it comes to fueling is, is what it's all about. Um, so let's dive into our topic um, for today and, and start talking specifically about nutrition. Um, Katie, I'll, I'll start with you um, just in terms of the role of fueling and nutrition for triathlon. Like when, when did you, uh, I'm sure when you were first coming up in the sport, it was a lot more about the training and, and you know, being in the right shape and the right fitness to, to prove to yourself you could do certain things. But when did nutrition come into play and, and when, how did you start like correlating the way you were fueling with your performance? I think like you're saying, when I first started, it was all about just like learning the sport. And so I wasn't as um, focused on nutrition probably as I should have been. But to me, I think it was just in general, I was overwhelmed by just learning triathlon. So nutrition kind of hit the back burner and it did for a good amount of time, I think really until I, I kind of like, I mean, I knew to have gels on the bike, but I wouldn't necessarily practice what I was doing in training for specifically for a race. And I didn't really have a plan for many of my races of like, this is what I'm going to do in the, in regards to like, uh, performance nutrition, I guess I, I would call it. And like, I would think about like what I was eating, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner before a race, but not necessarily like the gels, the drink, the hydration drinks. And I just kind of be like, oh, I'm going to hydrate like with like Gatorade or whatever is, whatever is there basically. <laughs> basically. Um, so like after, after Rio, I would say I realized, oh, like, I'm not just like learning how to do this anymore. I, I need to be a professional with it. And I need to take ownership in um, a lot of things with triathlon, but nutrition was certainly one of them and really having a plan going into races of like, and also training, but in my mind after Rio it was specifically thinking about <laughs> where I fell short and like not just having the nutrition on my bike or in my bottle, but actually figuring out when I was going to take it because that would be more my issue is I'd have all these things ready to go, but I'd never, I wouldn't touch them. I was too like nervous on the bike or I'd forget, like, it'd be like eight lap shoot. I'm already done. And I haven't, I haven't even taken my nutrition. So really I'd say when I know when I was speaking to you, when we first started talking with, with you can, I was trying to figure out, okay, like what's the best way. I, I mean, for me, probably the one, some of the biggest things before I think about like planning and how I'm going to use nutrition is a, that it would like work for me, be that it wouldn't hurt my stomach and that it tasted good. And it's something that I enjoyed. And so once like I figured out all those things, it was about like, okay, well now how do I implement this to be the most advantageous for training and racing? So, um, that's kind of like how I came around <laughs> with, with my nutrition and certainly have it as a focus now. And I say, one of the biggest things is practicing what I'm going to be doing in training. So that come race day, I like, am really dialed in and kind of know exactly what my plan is going to be and have an idea like, well, this is when I'm like, um, when I'm at this part on the bike, this is when I'm going to take like my gel, my edge, like, or, um, this is a good time to drink from my bottle. So those are, those are my, uh, when I first figured out how crucial it was. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. That, um, very interesting. Uh, Dina for, you know, they often call nutrition the, the fourth discipline of triathlon, right? There's the swim, bike, and run. And, but, it, it, you know, fueling is so critical. And especially as um, people are going longer, uh, half Ironman, full Ironman, I mean, the longer you, well, I don't know, I'm saying this, you can tell me if I'm right, the longer you go seems to be even more critical for people to get it right, or it's tougher to fake it the, the longer you go if, if you don't get it right. Um, just like generally speaking, when you work with athletes, like, is there, when, when do you start focusing on nutrition or like, is, are there certain, like, if you're exercising for this amount of distance, like you just got to make sure you, your, your fueling is right. Um, and sorry, before I let you answer that question, I just want to say when we're talking about nutrition, right? I mean, nutrition is such a wide ranging topic. There's, there's daily nutrition, there's specifically how Katie termed it performance nutrition, which is kind of like fueling around exercise. And 
for today's discussion, you know, while we may touch a little bit on the daily nutrition, we are going to be focusing more on the performance nutrition or the fueling or the, the exercise nutrition, if you will. So I guess I'll just reframe that question for you, Dina, like at what point do you really start focusing with athletes on their performance or exercise nutrition? Gosh, you know, I would say the sooner, the better. There's really no, no, um, like this is too early to start because I mean, even, even though the focus of our conversation today is more performance nutrition, I mean, it's, it's kind of silly of me to neglect the daily nutrition. So only if I, you know, if I have the opportunity to start there only because that will influence our performance, right. Just the, that baseline of health. But I think speaking in the realm of performance nutrition, it's fantastic if we've got at least two, three months in advance of an A race or a big race, or if we're just newer to the sport and have, you know, the the ability and privilege and so on to work with a nutritionist or dietitian, I think like there's no, there's no time um, where I would say, gosh, you know, it's, it's too early. (laughs) because there's so much uh, individual nuance here. We all have different abilities and goals, our health foundation, um, whatever the fitness level, I mean, gender differences, aging and all these things. But um, particularly for those who have had some experience in triathlon and maybe hadn't dive or dove into the nutrition realm, and kind of like me, like, oh, geez, I had some, some troubles and I don't want to waste any more time, like trying to figure this out myself, you know, being experimental for years. I think that can uh, give us cause to just expedite this process. Like let's get started sooner than later. And truly it doesn't take that long of a time to get some things rolling in terms of positives in in the practice of the performance related nutrition. So that's everything from the few days before, you know, getting ready for a race, but the few days before maybe some key training sessions, brick sessions, whatever, uh, to morning of and what we're doing during so uh, that's kind of a long, long-winded answer. All that to say, like, never too soon to get to get started. Yeah, and and you know, Katie had identified a few kind of criteria for her in terms of evaluating nutrition, like make sure it sits well in my stomach and make sure it tastes good. Um, when athletes are coming to you, Dina, by and large, and they're like, like, what are the challenges a lot of people are having with? fueling or finding the right fuel? What are the common things that you're seeing? Like, why aren't people so easily able to get this right? Yeah, I know. Unfortunately, you know, with, with the work we do, it's kind of like, oh, you come to us often when, when you have had struggles, right? Maybe kind of a little bit of what Katie was saying, like, I didn't know that it could be different. So I started learning more and trying to just fine tune it. Um, And so I think for a lot of, a lot of triathletes, especially as you were saying, Baron, like the longer that we're out there, half Ironman, Ironman, the more opportunity for error or mistakes or just things we didn't realize would happen. And so GI issues, gastrointestinal issues tend to be one of the, you know, top popular, unfortunately, um, reasons to to really work on the fueling piece. Um, what comes with that is again, kind of looking, and this is an oversight. A lot of us just didn't realize the the beauty of how we set up our pre training or pre workout food and fluid. How much that can influence, you know, the first few hours of how we feel to the ending part of whatever workout we're trying to accomplish or just like our recovery, our our fitness adaptations, all the gains we're looking for, whether that's speed or technique, ability, um, just getting stronger. Um, But then specifically within that is like, what's best for me to use from a sport nutrition product or a whole food product or how do I figure out fluids that I need and electrolytes and then trying to, you know, associate that with like, how are you feeling 
because it's all well and good to give numbers, grams of carb and frequency of, of eating or drinking, but, but we also have to understand how it is that you're responding to all of those inputs. And so I think that's where we can start tying everything together. Uh, aside from all the metrics that a lot of us collect, like heart rate and power and pace and all that jazz is like, how's this feeling for you? Um, Cause that's, that sheds a ton of insight as to the direction. Uh, yeah, Kate, and, uh, kind of transitioning from that to you, Katie, um, you know, you've worked with a sports dietitian, um, you know, at various times in your career, like how, how did you approach some of that? What Dina was talking about, like a, like an, interest and a desire to like understand maybe the science and why and how things were working in your body but also balancing this with like does it taste good and how does it make me feel like what kind of what kind of an athlete are you say when it comes to that balance I'm a more just tell me what to do type of athlete like I feel like I can get a little overwhelmed by all the information I like to know that like the all the backing and of course all of the uh, research that has been done but I more just want to know is it going to work for me and see in real life that it does work for me and then work with a nutritionist an expert in my opinion to to tell me like break it down for me when is the best time to use like each of these different things when like when would I want to take my edge when would I want to take in like the protein or protein plus energy and kind of give it a place in my schedule that I can see real time like okay this is what it is rather than um I'd, I'd rather just have someone tell me than me try to guess and interpret things myself because um I just feel like people who went to school for it know what they're talking about <laughs> know, know what they're talking about no doubt and that's why we do uh we are fortunate to have somebody like Dina who did go to school for it. So, uh, so Dina, um, coming back over to you in terms of like the, the needs for athletes when it comes to fueling, um, you know, in endurance sports, it's a, it's a carbohydrate dominated fueling strategy, right? So most, most endurance athletes are, are thinking about uh, if they're thinking about nutrition at all, you know, probably some of the things going through their heads are how many carbs do I need or how many calories do I need? You know, the, the timing of it. Um, and, you know, for some people, even going a step beyond that, they might do research and see certain like studies saying, oh, if you're going for multiple hours, you need 30 to 90 grams of carbohydrates per hour, then they're trying to shove that in and it may or may not work for them. So can, can you just kind of frame that discussion up for us? So, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking about carbohydrates as being our primary source of fuel for endurance exercise. If that's the starting point, like where the heck do we go from there? Yeah, gosh. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we got to start somewhere, right? So the recommendations from kind of the classic sports nutrition guidelines do give more a time base. So yeah, as you were saying, if, if we're going to be exercising or training or racing for a certain duration, here are the grams of carb that you consume per hour. Um, it's kind of I mean, it's, it is a starting point, but what is missing and what, what we as, you know, performance dietitians then do with that is, is again, learning, learning the athlete. Um, so it's almost like a flow chart. That's probably a huge, massive sheet of paper. If we were to diagram all the questions that we ask, but, you know, thinking of your experience level, your, the, uh, you know, what is your athletic ability? Are you someone like Katie here versus someone newer to the sport who maybe is brand new recreational, perhaps not elite professional uh, Olympic status, right? So there's a difference there in the energy we burn or the calories we burn. And that will tie to when we look at those ranges for carbohydrate fueling per hour, that's kind of like helping us to figure out a starting point for the amount of carbohydrate. But then within that, and something here, you know, unique to the UCAN line of, of products is like kind of carbohydrate. Um, because where we've come from over the last few decades is um, the carbohydrates being comprised mostly of, of simple sugars from energy gels and sports drinks. 
Um, but now we have so many different options for choosing that kind of carbohydrate. Um, so it's, it's like a different approach. Um, we know that carbs are so important to fuel the athlete, no matter the ability, but we have to figure out appropriate timing amount and then the kind of carb. So that's kind of like real high level. Um, but depending on, you know, the, the combo and things that we end up with, it can support enhanced performance or perhaps not work as well with the body. So that's kind of that experimentation. And, and like I was saying earlier, the sooner we can start on that, the more time we have to apply and finesse and, and really test all of the scenarios. That was a great, um, yeah, because it's not, it's not like, you know, it would be great if the easy answer to that question was like, yeah, it's 30. That's how much you should take. But clearly there's so much more context than that. And you've provided all that context. So that's, it's not an easy answer, but I think that like giving people a sense of, you know, there is this range, but at the same time, the range was, these were performance studies, right? So the range is coming from the highest of highest trained athletes. And if you're an age group athlete, you know, doing an Ironman at a weight or a, a triathlon at a way different clip than Katie, like your calorie demands and carbohydrate demands simply might be different. And that's probably, you know, working with a sports dietitian, practicing and training, that's where you're going to exactly. sort all that stuff out. Um, staying on that topic, um, uh, Dina, you know, you, you mentioned something there that I want you to elaborate on. You talked about the, the kind of carbohydrate, right? Um, kind of differentiating like how much or how often do you want to take it so why is that like what are what are different kinds of carbs doing in your body that makes you need to potentially take different amounts of them yeah and that's really important to think about so I think you know when we look at sports nutrition or any kind of food product that has a label and we see total carbs and calories what we miss there or maybe don't know, or we're just trying to learn here with the point of, of some of this discussion is like the kind of calorie, the kind of carb uh, has potentially different behavior, let alone taste and flavor and all that, but like how it behaves once it hits, you know, tongue and, and mouth to the whole intestinal tract. And so uh, like the digestibility um, the how quickly it might be metabolized or how long it lasts in your system. Of course, some of that ties to how frequently and how much we're consuming. Um, I haven't yet met a triathlete that's like, oh, yeah, I, I can't wait to visit the porta potties 16 times in my Ironman. Like that, that's usually not a goal of ours. It's to enjoy the experience and feel, feel very steady throughout and race as hard as we can, or, you know, have fun too, hopefully is, is part of the goal. Um, and so when we talk about carbs, it's like, do you, do we, and I'm kind of generalizing faster acting carbohydrates with the slower, but steady and maybe more gut safe kind of carbs. Um, or a mix perhaps of some both, right? And so, um, you know, the simple sugars like the origin or, or more of that, uh, the evolution of sports nutrition is from those very basic, uh, you know, glucose, fructose kinds of uh, base products to, to maybe a starch-based product or something that's got a very different molecular structure. And I know you'll you'll probably touch a little bit on the science here, Varun, before we're done today. But yeah, what that carb looks like from the its basic molecular component, you know, and the structure will really uh, influence the behavior of how it is um, digested and metabolized, and then ultimately how it works for us to sustain the performance level, hopefully without the porta potty visits. That's right. Um, and yeah, Dina, that's that, you know, I think a lot of athletes and, and Katie, I want to ask you about some of your experience with this, but I, I think a lot of athletes who have, um, you know, the sugar based approach to fueling, it's kind of what's most common. And for a lot of folks, it's the first line approach, given that, like you mentioned, a lot of the kind of first generation sports nutrition products that have really taken hold were comprised of these quicker acting simple sugars, right? And 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 you mentioned this, Dina, there's certainly 
a time and a place for needing immediate energy, needing quick energy. And, and those things can be beneficial depending on different athletes goals, but also as, as you've seen, and, and as other athletes have experienced when that simple sugar approach is the foundation of your entire nutrition plan. And you're doing that for three, four, five, eight, ten 10 hours. Like for a lot of athletes, it just becomes hard to keep up with either because of the energy fluctuation or because of the GI issues that you guys have both pointed to. Um, Katie, I know in, in your experience, um, as an uh, triathlete, as long as you've been doing this for, you've probably had the opportunity to try anything and everything. Have you had experience kind of with the, the sugar-based fueling approach and, and maybe riding that wave? Like, like, did you initially turn to that approach? Um, and if so, like, what was your experience if you have had practice doing a lot of like higher sugar fueling? For sure. Yeah. I definitely use the sugar-based approach for like, I would say the very, the beginning of my career up until I started and up until I switched to UCAN. And, um, I think it, it works for the short term, but it would also like not be what would carry me through a race. And particularly what I would struggle with too, is if I didn't take it, <laughs> like if, because if I, like I said, if I missed taking it on the bike, it was, it's obviously not, not going to work, but like with the longer, slower release, like with UCAN, it's more thinking ahead and pre like preparing. So I'll take one, like before I even start the race, knowing that when it's a sprint distance, it's going to get me through like, um, like almost the whole race. And then with a Olympic distance, it'll be at least half the race. So that's definitely was like a, um, I guess comparison for me between when I would use more simple sugars. to when I would do slower release carbohydrate, um, and then also with the stomach part, it was really like finding out which ones worked for my stomach. And I would say like, I'm the type of person who, when it's coming to a race, usually I can't eat anything like, like real food wise, like three hours, like my last meal, big meal will be three hours before a race. And then within that window, it's going to be anything that can sit well with my stomach. So I use a lot more of the slower release carbohydrates for that so that I can feel um, good about where I am going into the race and not feeling like, wow, well, like running to the bathroom or like needing to find one. Like I feel just a lot more confident that I'll be good to go from pre-race all the way to post-race. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really important point. And I, I think, you know, you, you might have touched on this too a little bit earlier where it's, you know, so many times when we think about fueling, um, it, we're so hyper-focused on what do we take during. And obviously that's important. And especially as you go longer, it's important, but you can achieve so much and, and you know, save yourself so much stomach issues or like so many fueling issues if you're, you have a good pre-nutrition plan like Katie just outlined, right? Like if you're going into your race or your training session, having eaten and fueled in a way that's promoting like stability and steadiness, you're going to feel a lot better coming out of the gate and early on than, you know, you would be otherwise. Exactly. I, and I might just add, I mean, I don't know if Katie wants to speak to this, but just like the level, like even up here, not just all the other muscles, but like <laughs> our pre-race uh, anxiety, how that might play into the picture, but also just thinking of like performance. And I'm just thinking of, of the level of racing that Katie does, although so this applies to so many other athletes as well, is just like the focus that we need and concentration, let alone like energy, it needs to be trusted, right? It's got to be there, but also so that we perform physically, but also the mental support, like focusing on what we're doing um, skill wise. And so I think the, what is maybe underappreciated is the role of our nutrition choices in that realm. Definitely. I mean, the, the focus and the energy, the mind and the body can be so tied together when, and as both you guys know, having done these endurance events, when you're trying to dig deep and push, um, you know, it's so important to have that, that mental stability as well. Um, now, a lot of what we've been talking about here, you know, fast carbs, slow carbs, kind of the, the differentiation and, and how they work in your body, like it, it kind of ties back to this fundamental idea of blood sugar control. Um, and Dean, I know it's something that you talk a lot about in, in your nutrition philosophy, the, you know, metabolic efficiency training as well, which is really like when we talk about 
stability and energy and steadiness and not having the spikes, like these all center back to controlling blood sugar. Um, so Dina, could you just, um, both from like a performance standpoint, but also just from a health and fitness standpoint, um, because so many of the athletes that I'm sure you work with, like, um, I mean, it's definitely something obviously that Katie cares about, but she's also trying to push the envelope in terms of performance for a lot of people. The primary reason they're in this is for better health and fitness. So how does blood sugar control center back to all of these ideas like performance, health, and fitness? Yeah. I mean, I think if we just think about the food that we eat, so that can be, you know, again, amounts of food, types of food, timing of food, all of that, um, along with many other factors, like we can't neglect sleep and stress and the kind of exercise we do and, and some of those things, but the food specifically in this conversation, I mean, that will highly affect um, blood sugar. So how the food is, you know, the quality of the food and amount types of carbohydrates. Do we have protein fats, the quality, again, I, I kind of want to say that more than once, as you can tell, but, um, depending on like composition and again, timing, uh, the digestion and, and absorption of these foods and the resulting, um, like the blood sugar response can, can affect energy. And this is day-to-day -day levels, right? So this is again, mental energy, physical energy. Um, if we aren't experiencing fairly steady blood sugar control, perhaps we're not eating enough or we're not eating regularly or, the composition is off in whatever direction, um, we can feel flat, we can feel tired, we might on the other side might feel like we're chasing cravings, we're just not ever satisfied. And a lot of these subjective things that that we might consider, you know, complaints are like, this is disrupting the quality of my day, or I'm just not getting through a training session adequately or to the level that I need to be, it comes back to uh, blood sugar control. And so then that's where we start examining, again, quality and, and type timing and amounts of food and trying to play with the pieces to, to further support blood sugar control. And again, then if we translate that to food, Varona, I mean, it's it's like, yeah, do we have protein? What's the kind of carb or set of carbohydrates? What's the ratio of carb and protein? Um, looking at the timing and so forth. All of these things affect how uh, the blood sugar response and maybe, you know, throwing in the insulin response here as well. Ultimately, you know, that can uh, relate to a number of health conditions, especially as we age and go through, through time. Um, but as, as triathletes and endurance athletes, certainly we can ex experience, um, you know, our training quality to be compromised or over time, maybe we're not getting uh, the responses that we're looking for within a race setting, you know, that might be again, some highs and lows that we're experiencing uh, things that we're not really wanting in, in that kind of setting. So it's a good background, Dina. And like from a, we, we talked about this, but from a fueling uh, and from an exercise standpoint, like one of the, the prime ways to control blood sugar is to be more strategic in the use of sugar-based fueling products. Um, you, you alluded to this um, a little bit, but just um, from, a, from a daily nutrition standpoint, like give us, give us a few examples of like, good, you know, cause like even with Katie talking about like eating three hours out, um, like what are some good examples of foods, uh, different food combinations, not products, but food combinations that also are going to set you up for this blood sugar control approach instead of this like quick energy approach. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think it, if we talk about carbs, I mean, in examples, and maybe let's get, put it in the example of, of before a training session, for example, I mean, we're, we're not trying to do zero carbs, right. But it is um, combining the kind of carb that we 
might say is working best for us that provides instead of the quick, you know, it's, it's burned off within 20 minutes. It's a longer lasting kind of carbohydrate. And that that's been generalized, like lower glycemic kind of carb. We know now everyone has an individual response, but if we picked something like the oatmeal uh, example, and you know, it's a great source of carbohydrate. Uh, for a lot of us, it can work as a pre-training meal. However, that in and of itself is mostly carbohydrate, right? And so um, the blood sugar response might be elevated, which that's fairly normal, right? But what we're looking for is more a steady release and, and kind of the cliche, we want it to last a long time. And so the way in which we do that and foster a uh, more steady blood sugar response is putting in uh, some protein, maybe a few other fiber sources, but of course that's gonna be an individual picture as well. Um, perhaps we're adding other carbohydrates to it, for example, you know, the you can energy plus protein powder is something that a lot of athletes will mix in. It provides more calories, but it's also going to extend the time that that food combo works for us. And, and again, like it's steady, right? It's like the steady Eddie or steady Betty response. Like, oh, yay, I ate, I ate this food and I'm satisfied. I'm full for the period of time. Uh, stomach and gut are happy. There's no angry, angry gut talking to me. So that would be an example for some others, like, you know, the classic banana, um, a fruit source, it might be a little bit more quicker than the grain, like from the oat, but again, putting in and pairing it with a protein source, again, is just like helping out that blood sugar spike, but to be a little less, but also then a more steady response or a, a extended time that that combo will work. And let alone the benefit of just giving us more satiety, which I think is helpful when we think forward in time, like, oh shoot, I'm 10 minutes into my into my run and I'm, I'm starving already, <laughs> or I'm, I'm tanking already. Uh, that could be a low blood sugar response because the carb was processed so quickly. So adding in the protein would be a top tip there. Perfect. So I think that's, that's a great kind of thing for people to keep in mind. It can really simplify things. It's like from a, especially from a pre-fueling standpoint, if you're doing it with food and you want to promote this steadiness and energy and this evenness, then making sure, you know, you're finding a protein source that pairs well with your carbs, whether it's a protein powder, whether it's a, a nut butter, um, you know, Greek yogurt, things like that. Those all go very well with the types of carb sources Dino was talking about, fruit, uh, oatmeal, you know, you could easily find pairings like that. Um, Katie, anything we're saying connect with you in terms of like, hey, I, I, I pair those things together for my pre-training meal. What, what, do you, what do you typically like to do? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's pretty similar to what I'll have is like a bread with a peanut butter, like a peanut butter sandwich with jam or oatmeal with peanut butter added in, or as you said, like that you can energy plus protein is a, is one I go to definitely for, um, before, but if I do that, um, outside, I'll usually just do water because, um, I'm not a big dairy person before I, before I train, but post wise, I actually really like the, I do energy plus protein. And then I'll put in like all the, all the things, <laughs> peanut butter with it, like basically everything from the kitchen sink into a, <laughs> into my smoothies. But for sure, all of, like those are the ones you said are basically my tried and true <laughs> things. And I don't really experiment much outside of banana and peanut butter. Basically, exactly what you said. You get you gave like three examples and they're just the ones I use. <laughs> well, very good. Um, and I think, um, you know, as we um, kind of move on to the final stage of our discussion, I want to dive a little bit um, more specifically into you can and, and, you know, what you guys kind of recommend for you can. But I think. Um, Hopefully uh, what we've kind of established here off the top is like the, the quality of carbs matter in the sense of how they're going to impact the energy that you feel. And there's a time and a place for different types of carbs, but you know, for most endurance athletes, like you want that feeling of steadiness for as long as possible. Um, Dina and Katie both kind of shared like some different ways you can achieve that through 
whole foods, um, which, you know, leading up to a training session, post-training, um, those can be really, really beneficial. Um, for a lot of athletes, like relying on whole foods during training, not to say it can't be done, but it's, it's more challenging, um, both in terms of digestion, in terms of preparation. And so um, we, we've talked a little bit about this, but that's really what makes UCAN such a unique product um, that you can utilize in your training is that, you know, so you can, um, what's unique about it is that the carbohydrate, it's called Live Steady, and it's uh, derived from a non-GMO starch. So it's uh, a more slow burning starch-based energy instead of this quick acting sugar-based energy, you know, which is what you'll typically get in most endurance nutrition products. And one of the unique things about you can is because of the way the carbohydrate behaves and how steadily and slowly it releases, you don't actually need to pair it with a protein source, like we've been talking about to achieve this steadiness of blood sugar, right? Now, the UCAN will almost do it by itself because of how slowly and steadily the starch releases. So that makes it really, really unique in terms of how it's behaving in your body compared to other things that might look like UCAN, right? I mean, there's that you guys walk into a tri store or a bike shop. I mean, there's many different brands of powdered drinks on the shelf and there's many different brands of bars and gels. Um, but even though they all look the same, the type of carbohydrate they're using is really what makes all the difference. And that's where you can is very different. So Katie, starting with you, like, how did you learn about you can and what was like, what made you want to try it or, or kind of once you used it, like what made you want to continue trying it? I mean, I think for me, it was being introduced by Howie, who's my agent and just giving it a try and feeling and seeing like the real life sensations that I had and just feeling good using it. And as we said, like my stomach was fine. I felt like my energy was good for my sessions. And um, I like the idea of not having to take so many things, because like I said, it's really hard for me, especially in racing to be like, well, I'm going to have to take like five gels in order for my energy level to like stay at what I needed to be. I'd much rather just be able to preemptively take one before the race starts and then know like I'm going to have one on a bike on my bike for a sprint race, two on my bike for an Olympic distance race and that I can count on it that is going to give me the energy and my my body will respond to it in a way that doesn't concern me or I don't I don't even have to think about and I'm all about like that side of things being like the less I actually need to think about or worry about in a race the the more at ease I feel and so that was basically what I got started with was like um, I mean at the time they didn't have there weren't gels yet or we that came out just um, more recently but so having the drink mix um, within my drink and knowing like I could I could put the energy in there. And then also for me, um, like I like to eat m mainly real food throughout the days of like every day, like Monday through Sunday, but particularly like when I forget to have something planned, like you can is a great, uh, like I'll, I just have like, I get a box of the bars and I just dump them into the center console of my car because when I need one, it's usually when I'm in the car thinking like, oh gosh, I forgot to eat or I forgot to like plan something. And so having the bars for that purpose has been like a lifesaver on so many, so many different occasions. And the great thing about particularly the UCAN bars is just that it's really hard for me to find a bar that sits well with my stomach. I like normally that's like for sure a no-go. But with the UCAN bars, they're the one type of bar that I can actually eat right, like right before a training session. And it doesn't have to be, I mean, I could actually eat it like a half hour before the session and I'd be fine. And that's like really not typical for me for a bar. <laughs> Very cool. And, and kind of what Katie's talking about, you know, for folks that aren't as familiar with the product line, there's the UCAN powders, there's the gels, there are the bars and everything is centered around the same unique um, slow releasing carbohydrate. So it, you're essentially getting the same type of even energy just in different format. And there's slight nuances to each of the products in terms of how many grams of carbs they have and what else they have. But by and large, um, you know, whether you're using a powder, a gel or a bar, you kind of have that same expectation and feeling of energy. So it's really just a matter of what format athletes like to use at what time, you know, and what's most convenient. Um, Katie, I got one more for you on this, and then I want to um, jump over to Dina for a moment. Um, 
when you talk about the different distances and, and carrying one or carrying two, do you sort of have, um, so, you know, an average serving of UCAN has between 15 and 20 grams of carbohydrate in it, about 80 ish calories. Um, do you have sort of a one serving every X amount of time type of protocol that you generally like to follow? Yeah. And for the races, I'd say it's like, more not thinking necessarily about the time, but kind of where I am in, in the race. So I'll usually have one, like about 45 minutes before I start the, start the race. And then I always bring one with me in my swim bag or whatever is like going to be at the race start for me, just in case I'm feeling like I need a little more something. I just have it. And I can, if I, if I feel like I want something, then I'll have a gel again there, or I'll just I'll just leave it. And then I have one taped on my bike that because it'll have been about, about like 45 minutes to an hour or so, well, actually a little bit shorter than that first sprint race, but I'll usually have it at the beginning of my bike ride. So within the first two laps, my goal will be to have my next edge. And I would say I primarily use the edge because it's less, uh, I'll have the energy drink mix as well in my bottle along with usually water, but, um, I'm less consistent on drinking a whole bottle of water. So like with, with the edge, with the gels, I know that I can consume the, the whole serving. And so for races, I really depend more on them than I do for the drink mix. And so then I'll have one. Yeah. On the bike. And that one, because you can't litter, I always tuck into the top of my suit and then I put it and then I'll pull it back out on the run and I'll have it with me for the whole run. Um, and like at that point, uh, because it's going to be close to the race, whatever I take in on the run really isn't with you can really isn't going to have an impact at that point because it'll, it's everything that I've done before, but it's still like the taste of it. Um, and I've also kind of used like the combination of the fast like faster acting gel at that point in the race, just to have it like one you can and one of the faster acting ones, because it'll give me like that short burst if I need it for the very end of the race. And, and what Katie just oops. shared is like a perfect way. If you're going to combine the two, like we always suggest exactly what Katie's talking about, start with the you can and then move to something that's quicker, closer towards the end. Um, so yeah, that can, that can work very well in situationally for a lot of athletes. Yeah. And I also take a caffeine pill about an hour, like with the first gel that I take an hour before the race. So, so you're doing a caffeine right. pill with the, you can uh, along with the, you can gel. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yep. For those yep. folks that are looking for some caffeine, that's, that is next on our product formulation, uh, list to figure out is that, that you can caffeine gel. Um, Good stuff, Katie. Super insightful. Very, uh, very helpful to hear how you think about it. Um, Dina, um, for you, and I, I am looking at the clock here, and uh, we will wrap this up in just a few minutes, but, um, but Dina, for you here, um, you know, you can, like the blood sugar control, like we've mentioned before, it's it's so tied into like your overall nutrition philosophy, so it really kind of makes sense. Um, but obviously in your position as a sports dietitian, I'm sure you've had a chance to test everything, evaluate stuff. You're also probably kind of have your antenna up for like, is what people are saying actually backed by research. So yeah, I mean, you've been using UCAN in different ways for, you know, uh, without dating our both of us here for uh, around 10 years now. So what, what is it about UCAN that's made you feel like it continues to be a good solution for the athletes you work with? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it is just, I guess this word that comes to mind is trustworthy, reliable. I mean, I mean, you probably would be able to say that about certain other foods, like a banana is always a banana, but I feel like when it comes to choice and so forth, it's like always easy to get in, um, especially if we're talking about like the energy uh, powder pre-training, pre-racing um, in all kinds of abilities. Uh, it seems like it it works well as when we think of weather conditions, um, but like in that pre-training, pre-racing time frame, um, as like a top-off kind of carbohydrate in that 30, 60 minutes prior just sets us up so well. But I think with the bars and the edge gel, I mean, just 
easy to chew or consume, you know, and just, again, when we think of steady, but still supporting performance, and it's not just for low intensity kind of, of training, right? It's, it's like a, a good baseline and we can always add more you can, or like we were just saying, if we're tapering or transitioning to using some other kinds of fueling, the you can is still this foundational piece to set us up for um, that first part of whatever it is we're doing. And we can, we can figure out then the other things that we need, but you know, the, the GI distress being so much lower. And again, just like, we don't have to think about it. Like Katie was saying, it's just, it works once you figure out the timing pattern and, and amounts and your, your favorite products. It's just, it's such a great option. And, um, I mean, yeah, having used the various products over the last 10, 11 years, I, uh, can speak personally to it. So <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. We've said this time and time again that there's no one size fits all approach, but is it, could you generally like say, what are like the key differences with like a, an like an athlete who might be used to a sugar-based fueling protocol and then comes to you and then they start implementing UCAN and now they're kind of primarily using UCAN um, to fuel themselves. Like, is there a general like, athletes I see using sugar are doing this, this frequently athletes using you can are kind of starting here. Is there any way you can kind of distill that? I think, yeah. I mean, generally it might be so that we, if we think of the energy classic energy gel, that's um, maybe a hundred calories, you know, the fueling timing might be about every 20 minutes or so. I think with the, you can, and thinking of the edge, the, the gel, that extension of time because of the unique nature of the carbohydrate like that, um, for a lot of, especially recreational, like your consumption might be one third less. It might be about a half less just because that product, that, that energy source lasts so much longer. Yeah. And that's kind of like, you know, even from our end, what we hear people tell us what we, you know, it's, it's interesting. We talk about blood sugar control and there's, um, you know, been kind of a, an, I guess, explosion in terms of awareness and in the performance world with continuous glucose monitors being more accessible to everyday individuals. So there's a certain, you know, maybe segment of people that are more in tune with blood sugar control, just as athletes and people who care about performance. And um, yeah, so being able to kind of test these different protocols and use products as they're intended to and seeing the blood sugar response. It's, it's been interesting. You know, we've seen a lot of athletes with the edge being able to go like, you know, an hour uh, per gel and still really feel that steadiness. But, you know, again, it's like, if you're an athlete that for whatever reason, the width of your metabolism, you need to use two, you can gels in an hour. I mean, that's no problem either. You know, like you'll still feel that evenness and energy, you just may need to fuel a little bit more frequently, you know, but you could still avoid like for, for athletes who fall into that category, a lot of the feedback we'll hear is like, Hey, I can actually take in the amount I needed to without, you know, messing with my stomach. Like some of the, some of the marathoners, the pro marathoners, whether it's Emma Bates or Kira D'Amato who are using, you can edge. I mean, they're using it, you know, more frequently um, than Katie talked about using it. You know, they might be using the edge every 20 or 30 minutes and whether or not they need to or not for them, they're like, Hey, it doesn't bother my stomach. I feel comfortable using it this frequently. Like that's a good enough reason for me to use it this frequently. And they still feel that evenness. So I think that for us is what's so interesting just in talking to different people. It's like everybody experiences the same feeling from it, but the way people get to that feeling is different. Like for Katie, it might be through using a bar for somebody else. It might be through using two gels an hour for somebody else. It might be a gel every 45 minutes. So that that's a lot of like the experimentation you want to, you want to go through when you're using it. Um, but guys, thank you so much. I mean, I could keep you I, I, out of respect for your time. I've already taken more time than I, I bargained for, but um, yeah, I could keep you on here forever, but um, really appreciate all the insight. Um, we haven't lost anybody in the audience. So uh, people were hanging on to what you guys were saying. Um, for everybody who did join us live, if you joined us late, if you joined us at the top, you will get a recording of this uh, via email in a couple hours. So you can look forward to that. Um, Katie and Dina, any any final thoughts from you? Dina, I'll start with you and then um, we'll go over to Katie. Any Anything in summary that you think is really important for people to hold on to or remember? 
I, you know, I, the thing that comes to mind is just uh, this notion, like when we say it's a slower acting car, people think, but does that mean I'm not going to be able to race hard, train hard? And that doesn't align really. So I think just, just knowing this is uh, a fuel source that can support the highest level, obviously with Katie being able to speak to that <laughs> Olympic medalist and amazing professional triathlete. I think that's the thing is like this change in how we view the language even. And so that that's kind of the thought I just wanted to mention. That's, that's such a great thought. You, you, I, you'd uh, enjoy sitting in on our marketing meetings because we always talk about that. We're like, we want to distinguish that it's slower, but also like, you know, slow carbs to go fast. Like, like you said, look at Katie's. Yeah. So, right. uh, yeah, no, really, really, really good point. You know, it's like that, that steadiness and stability is actually what allows you to express your fitness and to, you know, execute everything that you've done in training. Um, Katie, how about you? Anything that you would like to add? Yeah. Also that I've just used it in different dynamics of my life, other than training like when uh, during my labor <laughs> I had the protein plus energy um ready to go because you're not allowed to take in like real food or at least our hospital didn't let us so um yeah I had I had that and maybe maybe that's why we'll have a second child one day um I'm not I'm not <laughs> sure but um and then also like with the bars I was saying like I think I used different like I wouldn't be taking the edge just as a non-athlete so much, but I would use the bars for day-to-day -day life. I use the hydration mix, <laughs> just had some at the beach because it's very hot here. Um, so, or like the actual hydrate mix, not, not the energy. Um, but yeah, I just think it's finding what works for you and kind of exactly what Dina said, how I would describe it is just dependable and reliable. And that might not sound like so sexy, but it's, really, really makes you be at ease when you're in your training sessions or racing or whenever you feel like you need it, like, you know, that it's going to, you're going to only have to do very little work yourself for a longer reward. <laughs> very, uh, no, that's, that's such a good point. And I think that just like ties back to this idea that, you know, because it's not high sugar energy, then there is an opportunity to implement it into other parts of your life, you know, um, where it'll give you that same benefit. Like, yeah, it's like for a lot of people, I just tell them, think about it. like anytime you want long lasting uninterrupted energy, like you can, is a good option. Obviously it's not you need to mix in real food and, and that should be the foundation of your diet. But it's like when you're in a pinch and you need long lasting energy for your day, you can is a great option. And now I love to hear that it, it worked well for you in labor, Katie, because it, it was a lifesaver for my wife too. I think yeah. that was when, that was like her aha moment with you, Ken, was when we had our son and for two days in a row, she was just drinking energy plus protein out of a straw. And she was like, wow, I actually, all things considered feel okay. So <laughs> that is the true test. Uh, well, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate this. Really great insight. Um, Katie, good luck with the rest of your season. Excited to see what's ahead for you. and also. Can't believe we're going back into another Olympic year. So lots of big opportunities ahead. And and Dina, what uh any crazy adventures for you? Are you running a hundred miles or doing anything, anything yeah. outrageous anywhere? Actually, yeah. I have a slow hundred mile hundred mile uh ultra run in September. So uh quite different, but uh we'll be incorporating you can as a part of that. Fantastic. Well, yeah. um, you know, where can people, um, if they like what they heard today, how can people follow you? How can people um, connect with you? Oh, thank you. Uh, Nutrition Mechanic is the website, nutritionmechanic.com or on Instagram, same, same name. Fantastic. And Dina, she's got a podcast, the Inside Sports Nutrition Podcast, which she co-hosts. Um, you can uh, rely on her for a different type of dietitian work, or I'm, I'm sure she's got a whole um, set of services on our website. So she's a fantastic resource. Like I said, we've worked with her at UCAN for 10 plus years and, um, you know, give her the greatest vote of confidence. Um, and Katie, how can people follow you? Yeah. Instagram or Facebook. And it's, uh, Katie's a fierce athlete for Instagram or for Facebook and Katie's a fierce six for Instagram. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, best place to keep up with what's happening in Katie's training, um, share some great wisdom on, on what's going on in her life her motivation as well. So, Follow them both and thank you guys very much. Really enjoyed it.